Well, in my uh, desire to uh, reach the end of 1 Samuel, I almost skipped today's chapter. Uh, because when I first looked at it, I thought, well, there's just, you know, not a lot there. There's not a lot that can be preached from this story. It's the story of uh, Nabal and uh, Abigail, David. And uh, it almost reads like sort of a, a sidebar, a sidetrack to the rest of what's happening in 1 Samuel. Uh, but the more I looked at the chapter, uh, I just couldn't put it down and couldn't walk away from it. Uh, I just feel like there's a whole lot here. And God has shown me a lot this last week as I've studied and prepared uh, this message from 1 Samuel uh, 25. Abigail uh, just exhibits this incredible wisdom. When you read this story, uh, there's no indication that she's a prophetess or anything like that, but she just has this depth of wisdom, uh, a spiritual insight into what's happening. And as you read the story, you wonder how in the world did she come about such deep wisdom? And then, of course, the question is, how do you and I acquire that kind of godly wisdom? And I know in my life, I need lots of wisdom. And I need a kind of wisdom that this world doesn't provide. And uh, I see this in Abigail. And so I want to look with you this morning at 1 Samuel 25. Uh, we're going to kind of breeze through the first part of the story. Uh, if you don't remember the story or don't know the story, uh, the story goes that uh, David was living in this region of Maom. And he and his men would provide protection, as uh, all of us experience protection from uh, political structures that are in place. As much as we don't like uh, various politicians, there is a sense of safety and security that all of us have because there are political structures in place. And David uh, is, uh, has sort of taken up residence in this area of Maon, and Nabal was a businessman in that area, and he ran a very large sheep operation. It says that he had 3,000 sheep. Uh, that's quite a large uh, operation. This is not a, a one-man hobby farm. This is a, a big uh, farming endeavor that uh, Nabal is overseeing. And so during the sheep shearing time, which is a very festive time, uh, David sent some young men to go speak with Nabal. And he wanted to make a request of Nabal uh, that for uh, the protection that was provided to him, that maybe he could return some of that goodwill in the form of some food to help David and his men uh, who were standing guard in that region. And uh, this didn't go over very well with Nabal. And we'll see that this morning as we uh, talk about this story and as we look further into it. Uh, Nabal is a very difficult person. He's a very hard man. And uh, so this request did not go well, and David's young men were rebuffed and went on their way back to meet David. And when they got to David, they gave the report of what had taken place with Nabal. And as a result, David decided that he is going to go meet up with Nabal and kill him and all of the males in his household. David was going to take vengeance on Nabal for his ill will towards David and his men. And then Abigail finds out about this. She didn't know that uh, David had sent men to make this request. And so she's going to step in and try to bring peace into this situation. And that's where we're going to pick up uh, the rest of the story and uh, look at it in just a minute here. But just know that sheep shearing was a very festive time. This was a very celebratory time uh, for Nabal or anyone who uh, was herding sheep. And uh, it was a time when the paychecks would come in. I was thinking back to an experience I had when I was a young man. Uh, first in the ministry, I went to western Minnesota, and uh, we were running a camp out there and participated uh, for a Sunday with this particular church that was in a wheat farming area, a very large wheat farming area. 
And the pastor was telling me about how unique the situation was in their church. All the men in the church, except for one, were wheat farmers. And uh, so he was telling me that it was about the time of the wheat harvest, and uh, they could not set the church budget until the wheat harvest came in, and everyone gave offerings based off of uh, how God had blessed them in the wheat harvest that year. And he was telling me, you know, it wasn't a super great year, but it wasn't a terrible year, and we just don't know until uh, the men receive their uh, checks from uh, the granary uh, how the, the offerings would go. And uh, he said, there's one man in the church, though, that is not a wheat farmer, and he happened to be the a janitor at the local high school. And so, uh, of course, everybody in the church knew what this man gave because every week his uh, offering would go in uh, to the offering. And, but he was the only one that didn't wait until the wheat harvest to give uh, to the church. It was a really interesting uh, scenario, and it was a very celebratory time at the end of the year. Uh, because they, you know, were waiting for payday, and that's when uh, they determined how they would uh, give an offering to the Lord. Um, it was really an interesting scenario. So I can kind of relate to what this was like in the sheep shearing time, when uh, they would uh, see the fruit of their labor from the previous year. And then one of the things that we're going to see play out in this story is the contrast between Abigail's generosity and Nabal's stinginess and his foolishness. Abigail is this wise, uh, godly woman, and Nabal is this ornery, stingy man. And uh, in verse 11, we see Nabal say, my bread, my water, my meat, my shearers, as he's talking about his sheep shearing operation. It was all about what he owned and what he controlled. I was thinking about that this week. You can learn a lot about a person by the way they talk about the possessions that God has placed in their hands. It tells a lot about a person's character. But Nabal's stinginess is counterbalanced by his wife's wisdom and generosity. We're going to see that in just a minute. And when these men came back to report to David, one of the things they said in verse 16 is, it's like there's a wall between us. <clears throat> David was inquiring about the conversation they were having, that they had had with Nabal. And they said, it's like there's a wall there, like he is shut off from us. Sometimes we use similar language when we talk about relationships. We say, I feel like there's a wall between us. I feel like there's something uh, blocking my communication with this person. And that's kind of the report that David's men were bringing back. And interestingly, uh, names, as they often do in Scripture, mean something. Abigail's name means, my father is joy. And uh, one of the commentaries that I was looking at actually capitalized the F in fathers. And uh, certainly, uh, she was a joy to her own father, but apparently she was also a joy to the father above. Nabal's name, on the other hand, means fool. I don't know, you know, what it takes to uh, get the name fool. Uh, we've had two grandbabies in our family uh, this summer. Neither of them have had received negative names. Uh, they were, both have received names that were significant in our, our extended family. And uh, names mean something, though. And often in Scripture, names play out in the story to sort of show what the character of this person is. I don't know how uh, Nabal ended up with the name fool. How do you know that a baby is going to grow up to be a fool? But that's the name his parents gave him, and that's the name uh, that he has been living with his entire life. And apparently... He's been living up to his name as it plays out in the story. One of the, uh, in the Hebrew text, it actually, when it talks about Nabal, it describes him saying that, um, that his being is like his heart. That his being is like his heart. And I think this is a reference to Psalm 14.1, uh, which says, a fool has said in his heart, 
there is no God. And apparently that's the life that Nabal is living out. We know that scripture uh, doesn't only talk about a person being foolish in terms of whether they're wise or not, but it talks about a person who is a fool that they do not know the Lord. And they do not pursue a relationship with the Lord. So Nabal is egotistic and he's brash. We hear him repeating this, uh, these words, I, my, uh, I and my appear a total of eight times apiece uh, in this story. He says, I take, I slaughtered, I gave, I give, I know, uh, my bread, my water, my meat, my shearers. Uh, you get the impression that everything revolves around Nabal and his ego. Well, the story of Nabal and Abigail is interesting, too, because it's sort of a, a sidebar in the stories of the latter part of 1 Samuel. Uh, it almost seems like it's a detraction from the story about David and Saul, and David being on the run and Saul pursuing him. And it's hard, though, to miss the similarities between uh, Saul and Nabal. And I think the insertion of this story is intentional because Nabal is sort of an antitype of Saul. He's sort of uh, the alter ego of Saul. And very fitting that there are these similarities uh, between the two. I think it's intentional. Uh, it's mentioned that Nabal has 3,000 3, sheep. Saul is said to have 3,000 men. Uh, Saul takes David's wife, Michael, from him when David is on the run, and he gives him, her to another. Remember that story a few chapters back? David's wife was taken away from him. Here in this story, we're going to see how God takes Nabal's life, and then David takes Abigail to be his wife. That's how the story, I, I kind of gave away, you know, spoiler alert, in the end, David marries Abigail. I don't know if you didn't know that. but um, And then uh, David refers to himself when he is addressing Nabal, or when he sends his men, uh, refers to himself as Nabal's son. And uh, that makes him like Saul's, that makes Nabal like Saul's surrogate in this chapter. So you'll notice some of these similarities as we proceed uh, with this story. But this whole conflict arises because David has simply asked for a favor, a token of appreciation from Nabal for watching over Nabal's sheep and his enterprise. This is not uh, to be interpreted as a mafia uh, operation. Uh, I grew up in Chicago. Uh, the mafia would show up and re uh, expect payment for services, they would call it, and uh, you better pay up or somebody's legs would be broken. This is not like that. Um, David went in goodwill and was asking a favor of Nabal, and uh, he was rejected. And David thought that this sheep shearing time would be a good opportunity because everybody was going to be in good spirits and celebrating. But the opposite is what plays out. And Nabal rebuffed David's men and sent them back to David. It's interesting that David, when he had the opportunity to take revenge on Saul in the cave, remember when David cut off the edge of Saul's robe? It's interesting that he had the, the opportunity to take vengeance on Saul, the king, in the cave. Uh, but here... Uh, he rejects, or here he's going to take on the opportunity to have ve vengeance on Nabal. So he didn't take revenge or vengeance on Saul, the king, but here, someone who would be considered lower down on the totem pole, he was fully ready to go and take vengeance on Nabal, even killing all the males in his household. And so then we come to the speech of Abigail, this uh, sort of uh, presentation uh, that she gives to David. And that's really the heart of the story. And I thought we could pick it up reading. Uh, we'll start in uh, 25, verse 18 through 44. 
Then Abigail hurried and took 200 loaves of bread and 200 jugs of wine and five sheep already prepared and five measures of roasted grain and a hundred clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and loaded them on donkeys. And she said to her young men, go on before me. Behold, I am coming after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. And it came about as she was riding on her donkey and coming down by the hidden part of the mountains that behold, David and his men were coming down toward her. So she met them. Now David had said, Surely in vain I have guarded all that this man has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed, all of that belonged to him, and he has returned me evil for good. David saying, I gave this guy protection, and nothing was ever stolen from him because my men protected him, and he's returned evil for good. Verse 22. May God do so to the enemies of David, and more also, if by morning I leave as much as one male of any who belong to him. In other words, David's declaring that he's going to kill every male in Nabal's family. When Abigail saw David, she hurried and dismounted her donkey and fell on her face before David and bowed herself to the ground. And she fell at his feet and said, on me alone, my Lord, be the blame, and please let your maidservant speak to you, and listen to the words of your maidservant. Please do not let my Lord pay attention to this worthless man, Nabal. Listen to how she talks about her husband. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. She's saying, I didn't see these guys that came, and I missed the opportunity to give them of our resources. Verse 26, Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has restrained you from shedding blood and from avenging yourself by your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek evil against my Lord be as Nabal. I'm going to talk about that verse here in a bit. I think there's a whole lot going on there that you don't really see when you just read it over quickly. And now let this gift which your maidservant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who accompany my Lord. Please forgive the transgressions of your maidservant, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house. Because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord, and evil shall not be found in you all of your days. And should anyone arise, uh, should anyone rise up to pursue you and to seek your life, then the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies he will sling out as from the hollow of a sling. And it shall come about when the Lord shall do for my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and will appoint you ruler over Israel, that this will not cause grief or a troubled heart to my Lord, both by having shed blood without cause and by my Lord having avenged himself when the Lord will deal well with my Lord. Then remember your maidservant. In other words, when God has uh, done good to you in the end, remember me, is what she's saying. Verse 32, Then David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. And blessed be your discernment, and blessed be you who have kept me this day from bloodshed and from avenging myself by my own hand. Nevertheless, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has restrained me from harming you unless you had come quickly to meet me. Surely there would not have been left to Nabal until the morning light as much as one male. So David received from her hand what she had brought him, and he said to her, Go up to your house in peace. See, I have listened to you and have granted your request. 
Then Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he was holding a feast in his house like the feast of a king. Uh, and Nabal's heart was merry with him, within him, for he was very drunk. So she did not tell him anything at all until the morning light. But it came about in the morning when the wine had gone out of Nabal, that his wife told him these things, and his heart died within him so that he became as a stone. And about ten days later it happened that the Lord struck Nabal and he died. Uh, we'll go ahead and finish out the story now, and I've got some comments about the ending in a bit. Uh, verse 39, when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and has kept back his servant from evil. David recognizes that the vengeance he was going to take was actually evil. Uh, the Lord has also returned the evil doing of Nabal on his own head. Then David sent a proposal to Abigail to take her as his wife. Uh, when the servants of David came to Abigail at Carmel, they spoke to her, saying, David has sent us to you to take you as his wife. A and she arose and bowed with her face to the ground and said, Behold, your maidservant is a maid to wash the feet of my Lord's servants. Then Abigail quickly arose and rode on a donkey with her five maidens who attended her, and she followed the messengers of David and became his wife. David, and this, is, this next part is just sort of a summary, uh, summarizing events that had taken place in David's life. David had also taken Ahinoam of Jezreel, and they both became his wives. Now Saul had given Michael, his daughter, David's wife, to Palti, the son of Laish, who was from Galim. This speech of, of Abigail's is just, to me, amazing. Her bravery is uh, just unprecedented. Her bravery is amazing. She rides head-on into a brigade of 400 men who were coming to kill uh, her husband and all the males. Probably not just the males in his family, but also the men who worked for Nabal. They're bent on violence, and she just rides that donkey right up to meet David face to face. She knew that time was of the essence if she was going to convince David to change his mind. She's on a peacekeeping mission, and she intends to save her family at all cost. I imagine she would have had young sons and maybe grandsons that she wanted to protect. And she rides head on to meet David and to um, speak to him and try to dissuade him from what he's about to do. This speech of Abigail is the longest recorded speech of any woman in the Old Testament. So I think it's significant. Uh, the writer saw fit to make sure that we had the speech uh, recorded and that we could learn from what she has said and how God is working through her. And be sure that this is not an argument. I want to make the point that this is an appeal to David's conscience. There's a difference between an argument and an appeal. Uh, arguments don't usually accomplish much. I'm sure we've all seen plenty of arguments carried on in social media over the last week. It's just uh, nauseating. Nobody accomplishes anything by arguing. But God can accomplish things through an appeal, as Abigail has done. I had a vivid reminder uh, this last week about all of this. Uh, we've all seen the news about the shooting in Uvalde, Texas. Horrific event. Uh, I'm sure you've been praying, I've been praying for those families, uh, for God to somehow take this horrific event and use it somehow for good. Uh, God does that. We know that God is in the business of taking terrible situations and bringing good out of them. And that's kind of how I've been praying, as I've also prayed for comfort and healing uh, for those families who have experienced this terrible tragedy. And on Friday, I was watching the news tried not to watch a whole lot of news 
but I was watching the news and this newscaster was standing in front of the school and uh, the camera shot was wider than uh, what this man was taking up and as he was speaking he was just bemoaning all of the mishaps and how the police could have done more and how the community could have stepped up and was the police officer at the front door did he take the appropriate action and did the police going in did they do everything and he was just uh, bemoaning all of the things that possibly could have gone wrong looking for somewhere to point blame and certainly America has those questions on our mind these days but as this man was speaking it was a very long interview as this man was speaking a group of about six or seven men walked into the camera shot behind him I wrote about this in the newsletter this week and I thought it was out of place like what are these guys doing and why didn't they you know zoom in on the interviewer and leave these guys out but the cameraman just left the wide angle and these men walked behind and they huddled up in front of that school and they bowed their heads and began to pray and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and this went on for the entirety of the of the interview and I just kept thinking as this man was complaining about all the terrible things that were happening these guys are huddled up and they're taking their concern to the right place to the Lord and asking for for his help uh, some of them were wearing uniforms and I suspect that they were very concerned about the job they were having to do and how it would affect them personally and their families. I'm sure some of those men knew families of the victims. They knew that they needed to go to the Lord in prayer. And as they were praying, I kept thinking about this interviewer as he stood there and was going on with his uh, tirade and his bemoaning all of the terrible things that happened. I kept thinking, turn around. Turn around and pay attention to what's happening here. It's amazing that in the midst of this terrible thing, some people saw fit to take their concerns to the Lord. So Abigail goes on with her appeal. If you ever find yourself with the opportunity to have one of those family interventions, uh, maybe you've been a part of some of those things, if you ever have the opportunity or feel the need to go to someone and to bring your concerns to them, if you've ever had to have a hard conversation with a loved one, there is some amazing wisdom in this appeal that Abigail lays out before David. And I think there's a lot that you and I can learn uh, from what she says to David. In verse 27, uh, she brought a gift. I, I put in my notes, I guess, I guess it did make it up there. Uh, bring a gift. Uh, my mother uh, would always uh, prepare me when I was a kid, if I was going to somebody's house or meeting somebody new, you know, bring a gift. Uh, it's a way to introduce yourself to someone uh, it's a way to bring goodwill upon another. And she has brought an amazing gift. It's all detailed there in verse 27, all that she brought. It was quite a load. It must have taken uh, several donkeys to load all this up and to bring for David and his men. And really, Abigail was bringing what Nabal should have given David in the first place. Nabal should have shown David that appreciation uh, for how he had served him. And then this uh, startling statement by Abigail, uh, where she tells David that her husband's name, which means fool, sums up who he is. Imagine a, a wife speaking about her husband so publicly uh, uh, in this way. And this is a hard thing for us to understand in our culture. I think there are some cultural things that play in here. But her characterization of Nabal as a wicked man and as a fool has often been misunderstood and mischaracterized as heartless and self-serving. That she was only trying to save her own neck by putting her husband down. I don't believe at all that's what was happening. Based on the description we see of Nabal, he must have been a terribly difficult person to live with. And I think Abigail was just calling it what it was. I imagine she would have had a very challenging relationship with this man. 
if this is the way he treated David, somewhat of a stranger, imagine how he would have treated his own wife. I think she's just calling it what it is. Proverbs 26, 5 says, Answer a fool according to his folly. She's talking about her husband based on the character and the reputation that he had earned. And it really is uh, appropriate. So let's look at some of the statements she makes in her plea. There's great wisdom, well beyond earthly wisdom, that comes out in this story. Verse 26 says, Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has restrained you from shedding blood and from avenging yourself by your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek evil against my Lord be as Nabal. She's saying, let anybody that comes up against you be like Nabal. What is she saying here, be like Nabal? I think there is almost a prophetic sense that's going on here that she knew that her husband was probably going to die. And there are times in life when you see certain behavior in a person going a certain direction that you can discern that you can uh, discern that that person is probably not long for this world. And then uh, notice too that David uh, calls down this curse upon his enemies. Uh, we compare this statement of Abigail with, uh, or the statement of David with uh, verse thirty-eight where it says that Nabal died 10 days later. Um, some great theological questions we could have a whole sermon on. Did David call down a curse upon Nabal? Uh, I'm not sure if it was a curse or if David just had the discernment to see that Nabal was going to reap what he was sowing. So then Abigail just lists these six reasons that David should not take a vengeance on Nabal. Notice the deep wisdom, the spiritual insight that she shows here. Uh, verse 28, the Lord will make for you an enduring house. Uh, her statement sounds prophetic. It almost sounds like she's prophesying here that David's house, his uh, reign as king, was going to endure. This is actually years before the Lord uh, had this prophesied to David uh, long before David's dynasty was uh, prophesied. How did Abigail know? How did she know this? How did she have such deep spiritual insight? The rabbis of the Talmudic period uh, regarded Abigail among seven women who were graced by the Holy Spirit because of her sense of prophecy and her deep uh, spiritual understanding. Uh, so the rabbis thought that she had some special endowment of the Holy Spirit. And it was recognized uh, that this is beyond normal human wisdom. The wisdom she exhibits in her appeal to David shows deep spiritual understanding of events. And she sees the events of David's life almost with divine-like uh, perception. And as I read this story in her speech this week, I kept thinking, I wish I had that kind of wisdom. I wish I could know how to attain that level of wisdom and spiritual insight. That when I speak with people, that I could speak to them with the kind of insight and spirit-guided wisdom that Abigail had. And it sort of begs the question, how do we get that kind of wisdom? How do we become wise like Abigail was wise? Uh, 2 Samuel 7, 16. Did I give you that one? I did. Uh, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So it's in the uh, subsequent book of 2 Samuel that what Abigail is talking about here was actually prophesied officially. But she knew somehow that David's dynasty would endure. The second one. In verse 28, she mentions that David was fighting the Lord's battles. How did she know this? How did Abigail know that David was fighting the Lord's battles? I suppose there was some sense which 
uh, anyone who lived in the land knew some of the story of David and Saul and some of the things that were going on. We knew that it was known among people that uh, you know Saul had slain his thousands and David had slain thousands of thousands. Um, so we know that their reputations had traveled, but how would she ascertain that David was fighting the battles of the Lord? And then in, in uh, verse 28 also, evil shall not be found in you all of your days. She's talking about David's character. Now we know that David was not perfect, right? We know that he was not a perfect man, but he did prove throughout his life to be a man after God's own heart, that he continued to pursue the Lord. This might have been just a subtle way of Abigail uh, asking David to consider his reputation and his character. Uh, we don't know, but she did have the sense that David was a righteous man. And then in verse 29, Abigail says that the Lord will protect David. It's this uh, sort of eloquent way she's saying, bound in the bundle, saying the Lord is going to protect you. And her statement kind of begs the question, why take revenge upon somebody the Lord has already marked out for vengeance? In other words, she's saying to David, you don't need to take vengeance because the Lord is surely going to do this. Let the Lord take vengeance. And that's what she's asking David to do. You know, sometimes the wisest thing we can do is to sit back and watch the Lord take his own vengeance. Boy, that would solve a lot of road rage, wouldn't it? <laughs> if we could just sit back and wait for the Lord to act instead of taking matters into our own hands. I know I'm guilty of doing that. We could just wait on the Lord and be patient for him to act. I think that's what Abigail is asking David to do. Verse 29, she also tells David that the Lord will destroy his enemies. Uh, this is prophesied in Scripture several times. We've read this in 1 Samuel already. And it's interesting that she says that she explains that destruction of the Lord uh, would be like using a sling against them. Now, I don't know if she knew the story of David and Goliath, but that word picture that she said to David had to have been spirit-guided. She's telling David, remember what God did for you with Goliath. And David was very clear. Uh, we went over that chapter. David was very clear that it was the Lord who took down Goliath and that he was the Lord's servant. Abigail is reminding David of how God protected him in the past and that that same protection would go with David into the future. How did she know this? How did Abigail know that this was what the Lord was doing and that this was what the Lord decreed. And then in verse 30, she implores David that taking vengeance against Nabal and his innocent household would be a guilty load on his conscience after he became king. You ever done something that you later went, man, I wish I wouldn't have done that, and your conscience bothers you? Well, she's telling David you don't want to do this because when you become king, then this is going to be a load on your conscience that you don't want to have to bear. Very wise in her interaction with David. And what a contrast between uh, what Abigail seems to know about David and how Nabal responded to him. Uh, in verse 10, what was Nabal's response when these young men came? Mockingly, who is David? You know, David, he's nobody to me. Abigail knew. Abigail knew that de the Lord's hand was upon David's life. She was very aware of that. Well, then in verses 23 through 33, David praises Abigail for her wisdom and discernment and for the Lord sending her to keep him from revenge. David has his praise in the right place. He's thankful that she had come and uh, spoken to him and made her appeal and he sees that it was the Lord who sent him sent her that it wasn't just a woman coming upon coming on her own initiative but that she was a messenger of the Lord David saw her appeal as a message from the Lord 
You ever had an experience like that where somebody came to you with something to say and later, maybe even if it was a difficult thing, later you look back and said, you know what? I think the Lord sent that person to come and speak to me and I probably need to listen to what they have to say. So David pulls back from his uh, move toward vengeance. It would have taken a great amount of humility for David to do this. But he decides that uh, vengeance is not for him to take. Which is harder? Is vengeance or is restraint harder? I think restraint takes more effort than vengeance. Verse 36, when Abigail came home to report what happened to Nabal, he was drunk and throwing a feast. I love that description. He was throwing a feast like the feast of a king. Though Nabal was not a king, he was acting like an authoritative dictator. And how ironic that Abigail had just declared allegiance with Israel's future king. There's further irony and that when she did tell him the next morning, it was the exact time by which David said all the men would be dead. And then, of course, in verse 37, it talks about how when Nabal heard this news, his heart became like stone. There's a great debate about what this means. Uh, was this a heart attack? Was this a stroke? that Nabal had had, uh, lots of discussion about what this could mean, could mean. Whatever it was, it does seem to be caused by the news that Abigail brought him. And then in verse 38, notice that it says that it was the Lord who struck Nabal. It wasn't David. The Lord did what David wanted to do, uh, but in the end, it was the Lord who struck Nabal. This same exact phrase is used later on uh, in uh, 2610 uh, regarding the death of Saul, uh, that the Lord struck Saul. This further pictures Nabal as Saul's alter ego. Nabal is a kind of Saul, even though Saul is only uh, insinuated in this chapter. And what, one of the things that we learn from this chapter is that the Lord brings vengeance in his time. That God will mete out his justice when God is ready. And in this story, vengeance would be in God's hands, not in David's hands. And sometimes God ex exacts his plan in such a fitting way. In this story, in God's plan... Only the wicked one would die, not his entire family. And I think that shows the character of God. It says that ten days later, Nabal died. I wonder why ten days. Was the Lord giving Nabal an opportunity to change his ways, to consider his, uh, his rudeness, his stinginess, his ornery heart? Maybe. Maybe God was giving him time to think over who he was and how he was acting. <laughs> Romans 12, 19 says, Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. I think that's one of the callings of a believer. Is if we trust in the Lord... If we trust that God is a God of justice, that we allow him to mete out justice in his own time. And yes, there are times when we are called upon to be the hand of God's justice. But in this story, we learn that it's best to allow God to be God and allow him to carry out his own justice in his time. And then, of course, the story ends with a happy ending. Uh, David takes Abigail as his wife, and of course she is uh, encouraged by this. This was good news for Abigail. She'd been living under uh, a tyrannical husband, and now is brought under the household of David. 
As I've been thinking about Abigail and her wisdom and this spiritual insight that she has, I keep asking myself the question, how does one acquire that kind of spiritual wisdom? How can we become so filled with the Spirit as she was? I want to know how to acquire that level of spiritual guidance. I want to be able, when I speak to other people, to have deep spiritual insight like Abigail had. And all I know is that wisdom like that comes from God. And we only acquire it by remaining close to him. Uh, just two verses as we close out today. James 1.5 If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. We need wisdom. The scriptures tell us to go to God and ask him for wisdom. And then, uh, we don't have time to read it. I was going to read it from my Bible, but maybe this week, get alone with the scriptures and read John 15, 1 through 17. It's the vine and the branches. The truth there is that if we remain in God, he will remain in us. That's all I know, how we can acquire the kind of wisdom and spiritual insight that Abigail has.